My life has been shaped by my love of color. And for many years, this was about chemical color. And then I became interested in structural color. To learn about that, I became the first artist in residence at the Alavisados lab at UC Berkeley. I'm Kate Nichols. I'm an artist. I synthesize my own nanoparticles and use them in the macro scale artwork that I make here in my studio. I first became interested in structural color because I was really jealous of butterfly wings, particularly the wings of the Morpho butterfly. They're this stunning blue color. The reason I couldn't create these colors with paint is because they don't arise from pigmentation. It's color that arises from geometry, minute, minute structures within the butterfly's wing, rather than chemistry. When I first got the germ of the idea that I maybe I could do this, create these stunning colors that just weren't possible to create with paint, was listening to NPR popular stories about nanotechnology. This was when I first realized that some people do deal with, with things this small. Even though I paint in thin layers with my oil paints, like they did in the Northern Renaissance, it's not small enough. Nanometers are a billionth of a meter. So wavelengths of visible light are between 300 and 750 nanometers. The length scales that you need to access to create this sort of color are infinitesimally small. I wrote an email to Paul Olivisados, who's the director of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Turns out um, he's a photographer and he was just as excited at the prospect of having an artist use these materials as I was. So today I'm making pseudo-spherical silver nanoparticles that are about 10 nanometers in diameter. And these are going to serve as seeds for larger triangular platelet particles that form spontaneously in the presence of the fluorescent lighting you see here in the lab. So in the lab I could create the entire color spectrum from nanoparticles. I chose to focus on silver nanoparticles because of their non-toxicity and the way they react to light. Essentially this reaction is about taking silver salt and making it into silver metal. We don't want to just make any particles. We don't want to make bulk silver like we see in spoons or necklaces. We want to make nano silvers. So I start with silver nitrate, which is silver salt, similar to table salt, only it uses silver instead of sodium. Next I add um, sodium citrate, which is vitamin C. In order to make sure that we create very, very small particles with specific structures, we want to control the silver salt's transition into silver metal atom by atom. So if this transition happens too quickly, the silver particles deposit any which way. But when we slow this transition down, we allow the native crystal structure of the silver to pattern the growth. We slow down this process in two ways, by doing the reaction on ice and by adding BSBP, a phosphonic acid to temporarily coordinate with the silver, keeping the amount of available silver at a constant rate. Being left out in the ambient light of the laboratory, which is fluorescent light, for about two or three weeks, the silver seeds that we just made turn these colors. This bottle right here is a good example of a solution that's probably mostly silver nanoprisms. So they're these flat, triangular platelets. This bottle is in transition, so some of the particles are spherical, some of the particles are prisms. And because of that, it sort of reflects that mixture in its color. These particles that are more blue, imagine you have rocks in a river. Over time, those rocks lose their sharp edges and they become very rounded. And the same thing is happening here. In liquid solutions, particles move around. They're very active. 
so the, the pointed parts of these triangles soften over time. And as they soften, they change into being disks as opposed to triangular platelets. And that corresponds to a color change. My oil paintings are images of bodies in motion. And I didn't expect to find bodies in motion in the laboratory. But what I realized was the phenomenon that's giving me my structural color is all about particles in motion. Surface plasma and resonance is basically a dance that electrons do with wavelengths of light. So imagine you have a metal particle and just on the surface of that particle is a cloud of electrons that sort of hang out in this swarm. And when you have a wavelength of light come in, it can sort of nudge this cloud off the surface. But the cloud still is very attracted to the surface, so it comes back down, only to be displaced again. And this sort of oscillatory motion ultimately gives rise to color. So as an oil painter, I was obsessed with the idea of permanency for years. Initially, I wanted to make things that were going to last forever. So now, you know, I'm working with scientists who only want to create materials that are going to last long enough to measure them. These pieces right here are science experiments themselves. Here we have glass capillaries and glass tubes that have liquid solutions of silver nanoprisms in them. And since these particles were only discovered in 2001, we have no idea what they're gonna do. They could turn back into yellow spheres. They could all aggregate, which is nanospeak for death. Or they could hang out like this for 30, 300 years. We have no idea. People have these images of nanotechnology as being very slick and very new and, and untouchable. So it was very important to me that the work that I make in the laboratory not have to be mediated by, by a camera or a microscope. I wanted it to be something that someone could touch and see with their own eyes, experience with their own senses. The form that these pieces ultimately took was the result of a lot of experimentation in the laboratory. I started thinking about the history of nanoparticles and how they were first used by medieval craftsmen who made stained glass windows in you know, 13, 1400s. And then I started wanting to bring in that history of silver and of nanoparticles. And I thought about, okay, well, how do we normally relate to silver? How have we used silver throughout time? I started playing with mirror making. This piece is actually part of a series called Body of Evidence. I was sort of playing with the idea that, you know, I'm this anomalous presence in the laboratory in that I'm surrounded by scientists who are trying to create reproducible results. But I'm interested in creating unique objects. I played with the idea of trying to make the same thing on three panes of glass and then superimpose them. And I chose a particularly volatile solvent to do this with. I used hexane. The thing about hexane is that sometimes it's very docile. Other times it just sort of explodes. In science, so many things don't work. They're experiments. So you can see as you look through the different layers how I, I wasn't able to create anything reproducible. Being an artist in the laboratory has been an exercise in, in lack of control. While you bring your own baggage to it, your own skill set, your hunches about what may or may not be true, you also have to let that go at a certain point and just be open to really you know, seeing what does happen. I'm in a field where I, I have no training. For me, it was an opportunity to really open up my artistic process and to let in the unknown 